Welcome, everyone. How are we doing today? Hope everyone's doing well. We're going to have a little bit of a fun discussion here on the Max Schmarzo podcast. It's going to be um, a good story time, a kind of a thought experiment we're going to go through. You have to bear with me because it will hopefully bring about some uh, important concepts that you'll find really useful. So we're going to talk a little bit about data collection, um, selecting the right metrics. And this is stuff, by the way, that is pertinent to anyone beyond strength and conditioning. Yeah, it's going to be talked about in a performance uh, setting in my pretend world where I'm an assistant GM of value creation. But it's something that's going to be very useful for you. If you're trying to run a business, you're trying to determine what store you should buy your clothes from. Um, all, it's just a wonderful example. So we'll just get started because I could talk about how cool it is or you could just walk through it all because it's cool first and foremost because I get to be an assistant GM. Someone's finally uh, listened to my crazy ideas and they said, you know what, Max? <sighs> We've been listening to your podcast lately. We've listened to your YouTube videos. We've read your emails. We've gotten your letters. It's time that we uh, we let you come and be an assistant GM. Assistant GM of value creation. So in this situation, I'm going to be handling and working with the current players or assets that we have to identify the best ways to get value out of them and for them. And the idea in any situation is to make something more valuable and from an asset management standpoint. So either you can use that asset, that player to trade for a player that fits into your system even better, or you have them performing higher than their contract currently is. You had them for quote unquote cheap. There's lots of reasons why you want to create value and the player wants that too. So I have been brought in. I said, thank you to everybody. I appreciate all my listeners. You guys have stuck along for the ride. And here I am now as my assistant GM. And one of the first things you want to do is you want to have definition. So I see this time and time again, this happens with the coaches. Uh, this is so common with strength coaches um, that you just begin to collect information and data for the sake of collecting information and data, right? You're, you're in a position where you now are responsible for um, trying to better your athletes, but instead of really breaking it down to first principles and the, the actual purpose, what we're trying to do, um, people get muddied down with arbitrary metrics. And when you use and collect a metric without definition, you then retrospectively try and make definition for it. And it becomes just riddled with um, confirmation bias and storytelling. And I'd say I call it play and pretend. Collect a bunch of data and you just play pretend. So I am now in charge and I am working with my GM and the GM and the coach and the president probably have some idea of a plan of what they would like the team to be. Um, and this kind of stems with the coach, a gym, a gym, a GM acquires a coach and this coach might have a specific player style, just like a chef chef works really well with these ingredients. This coach works really well with these kind of players. Um, they know how to extract value out of those players. And so the first thing you want to do is try and define and understand what kind of players a coach really likes to utilize and succeed with. Um, classic example would be like Mike D'Antoni, very famous with the Suns and the Houston Rockets, is known for shooting tons of threes, fast tempo, lots of three-point shooters. So he might value a three-point shooter higher than the... Uh, the old Detroit Pistons, um, the bad boys who didn't maybe value three-point shooting as much as rebounding and physical prowess, um, the ability to defend. And so it starts with understanding in the current situation, what does that coach actually extract value the most from? Because what we're trying to do here is every you could have the most amazing athlete, but if that coach isn't going to utilize that athlete, that athlete doesn't have much value to the team. Um, an example of this would be in a situation where it would be easy to write off Steph Curry's career early on if he was in a different situation because a coach might not have given him as much freedom. He had Don Nelson and Mark Jackson and had lots of freedom in his play, and that allowed him to develop the player who he is. 
another coach may not have seen that as much value. Um, even going back to his college days, someone might not have let him shoot those shots. Understanding and trying to define what a coach wants, right? And, and this is so important because it starts from the very top. A strength coach should not be responsible to try to define the metrics without any guidance that are most important for a team. That is so silly. A strength coach is not making the decisions. When you give the strength coach and say, hey, Mr. Strength Coach, we're going to try and uh, you're going to be in charge and you're going to be in charge of finding out how to make our players better. Well, better, what is better? Better is highly contextual. Like I said in the beginning, Steph Curry or the Pistons might deem better as one type of player, while Mike D'Antoni might uh, deem a player uh, that is better in a different type of situation, a different type of player, better, three-point shooter. So you need to define what you're trying to actually accomplish. And once you have um, some outline of definition, variables begin to um, matriculate out of this. Now, it's not always the case where the coach is going to have the immediate definition. It's almost like a filter through a strain when you're making coffee. You have all these ideas, those are all the grounds. Um, coaches don't always, and anybody who's not scientific in the human physiology world might say things like, oh, I like guys who have a lost spring to their step. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> so you might go through some examples, but you're working together to try and provide a definition because the more we can define something that's very nebulous and undefined, that is, oh, step in pep in my step or spring in my step means someone who's a creator who can drive someone who has a very fast first step acceleration who easily gets by their defender off one to two dribbles with the ability to pass to another opponent okay well that is very specific because i can work on players acceleration to drive and we deem the importance and significance to get to the paint at a high velocity something that's something we can easily train for um just say we want someone with a you know, spring in their step. Well, that's someone who's going to rebound. Is that someone who's you just like generally fast people? Right? We have to kind of define it and understand the utility of it because you might not want a big man with as much spring in the step because maybe you prefer like a, a Shaquille O'Neal. That's what a very specific, great big man I decided to pick. Um, maybe a larger bodied Kayvon Looney, someone who is going to be uh, strong, powerful. He's not going to be running the floor in the traditional sense, but he plays a role in what he does. So you start to break down this definition. And from there, as the assistant GM, is my job to create value. So I have two areas of value creation. I have the skills trainers, and I have the um, actual strength coaches. Again, the coaches value extraction. They're not going to be sitting there trying to create value of a player. They're not sitting there working on a player's left-hand hook shot. But if the coach deems that the player should have a left-hand hook shot, that's important for their performance and play, well, then as a skills trainer, we should work on a left-hand hook shot. So you begin to have here, you have a model based on skill limitations and biological, physiological limitations. So in this proceeding order, you have the coach's definition of what's important and significant, of value. Um, then you have, and this is very loose because at times uh, it might be changing and it might be modifiable. And that's really important to know. We just also can't modify every second. So you got to have some structure. We we're walking through this idea here really quick. Um, give me some leeway here, guys. It's a podcast. It's not a written out presentation. So the coach has this definition. I, the assistant uh, GM, and now in charge of this value creation. And we have to understand everything's going to be related to a specific skill in basketball. The skill of running fast and getting a rebound is a skill. Everything is skill derived. And so what happens is we have to look at the player and look at the situation and decide whether or not that individual's skill is constrained or limited by their physical capability. Oh, that person cannot be an explosive rebounder because they are not explosive. Or is it a technical limitation? That person's not an explosive rebounder. They have all the physical capacity to be explosive, but they don't express it on the court. So we have to work on actually building the skill be aggressive to get a rebound. This is really important. And this is a very important distinction and flow model that begins to create it, be created because not every player should have equal emphasis, weight room and skills training. doesn't make any sense. Um, it's about the purpose of lifting weights is to remove biological constraints that hold back a skill. 
It is also to maintain biological or physical abilities that allow for skill to be expressed. Um, and this is really important because now you start to look at, okay, I don't just want someone to be infinitesimally fast or infinitesimally jump high or whatever, because at a certain point, it's not even being used in their skill. If someone could immediately transfer all their athleticism to a skill, a basketball coach would merely just go look for the best track athletes and say, okay, well, we're going to just transfer your athleticism to skill and you'll be great basketball players. But we know that's not the case. And so um, you have this uh, area of flow where it goes from biological limitations to uh, skill limitations. And together they work in harmony because if you're trying to improve an area of a step back, or you're going to try to improve an area of a certain move, you begin to look at the certain physical qualities and traits that are constant or common, I should say, in those moves and whether or not they check off the boxes. If we're trying to improve then, okay, well, maybe let's work on the skill side. A really easy example is this. Imagine you have someone who is a three-point shooter, okay? And this three-point shooter is someone who needs to be able to play for five minutes straight in a very high tempo situation. In this situation, they're going to need to be able to repeat their shot at any point in time. So what we need to do is understand what is the conditioning aspect of being able to repeat your shot? Okay, well, if it's just running around shooting a shot, that's fine. But in reality, when you take a deeper dive into it, you realize that this three-point shooter basically shoots one of two shots. They shoot a set shot in the corner where they're set, prepped, and ready to make it down. There's no movement velocity. The variability typically just comes from a pass. Is it a good pass or a bad pass? And it's a shot that, in theory, if open, I myself could make it. Okay, well that's not going to be limited by physical abilities. But another shot they take is a really high velocity flare screen. So this is a screen where if I'm out of the ball, top of the key, max myself, I'm going to shoot the ball. I pass it to a wing. So let's say I pass it to my left. And then I'm going to sprint to my right as fast as I can, running along the arc of the three-point line. My big man is going to set a screen. I have to run really fast, catch the ball, and shoot it. Now, my separation here might be dependent on two things. One, the technical or tactical ability to fake someone out when I pass it to the left, make it look like I might not be going off of a screen. And number two is the acceleration off the screen. A subcategory of three would be the big man actually setting a good screen, but that's going to be his skill and that's his problem, not necessarily mine at the moment. So I have to be able to shoot at a high velocity. So that is a skill. The question is, if I don't run really fast in the first place and I have to run like 90% of my max speed to get this ball and shoot it, well, we know that closer we get to 100% capacity of anything, the more difficult it becomes to A, do it, because it requires, requires a lot of energy, but B, do other tasks. Try to sprint and do a math problem. It is very difficult. Probably not going to do it. Try and run fast, not sprint, and do a math problem. You can probably do it. Jog and do a math problem. It's easy. So there is a relationship between your physical intent and exertion relative to your cognition and your ability to actually appraise a situation. So if I can help that guy run faster or I can help him decelerate quicker and then he's running off of the screen no longer at 90%, but at 70% capacity, that person's able to shoot threes better. They are now of higher value. So what we're doing here is these metrics begin to define themselves. As a strength coach, we can identify very simple metrics. Um, because you're in a professional setting, uh, I hope that the, uh, the staff would be large enough if you're dealing with, I don't know, $300 million worth of assets, um, that you'd have enough of a staff and a framework to support $300 million worth of assets. Um, so hopefully the staff is not limited and hopefully the staff communication realized that as well. It's like uh, the relationship and the communication between the skill and the strength coaches should be very tight and understood because they're doing the same thing, essentially, right? They're both trying to improve a skill. One's doing it from one end of the coin where they're allowing the biological, the physiological limitations to be removed. Then the skill person has to then allow that, uh, the actual application. And now what can happen here is you can have subdivisions of metrics, which are kind of cool. We have the traditional metrics, like the biological limitations. And we have other traditional metrics, like how well do they actually shoot? You can have other metrics like GPS data. You might pick four or five, heck, maybe seven, but whatever is easiest to manage in that situation. And you begin to identif identify some sort of um, metric-based twin, you could call them, or a uh, 
a metric outline, or I'm lacking the word here, some sort of digital uh, twin, essentially, of that person. You have these metrics that represent them that are important for their skill. And then what happens is you can also measure the rate of improvement of those. And what's really cool about that, this allows the skills coaches to still be creative in the way that they are, allows their uniqueness, but you begin to aggregate data as to what skills and actual practice methods begin to actually improve skills. Because one of the things that's always interesting is why hasn't someone after four years of college basketball actually improved their shooting? And they go to the NBA, do they actually get better at shooting? And the question is always, well, why or why not? And the, often the skill side of things is so rarely tracked from an information standpoint. And there's a lot of budding heads in that area. Skills, people don't like it when you want to track information. It's too much of an art. It's not a science. So, okay, <laughs> there's a science of motor learning, believe it or not. There's an entire... Uh, research field of it, which seems to be desperately like missed by the entire skills training population. That's no ding on them. That's a whole educational beef I have with the uh, traditional educational system, not teaching skills acquisition anybody, but there's a lot of research on it. Um, we should begin to collect data and be creative in how we collect data and try and conquer, uh, overcome this question of value creation as a team. And when you do something like this, you begin to start developing internal intellectual property. The internal intellectual property that you develop is stuff that is specific to your organization that you don't need to share that gives you an edge. A really awesome example of this is someone um, like uh, the Warriors recently drafted an individual named Patrick Baldwin. Patrick Baldwin was a highly touted recruit out of high school. He went to Milwaukee to play for his dad in college for one year. He didn't play very well, he just, as well as people expected him. He got hurt as well. Whatever, a lot of stuff going on. No ding on the kid at all. Um, but he goes to the combine and has just very poor scores in the combine relative to what people expected. And then the Warriors draft him because Patrick Baldwin is still 6'10 and can shoot the daylights out of the ball. What's interesting is I wonder if the Warriors did an appraisal of the situation and said, well, he has certain biological limitations, but we actually don't see those as limitations at all. We can sit him down for a year and make him very athletic. We know how to make him physically more gifted. And so at the current draft stock, which I believe was a 24th pick or something like that, we think he's going to be extremely undervalued. He was projected to be like a top 15 pick, top 10 pick, but his physical attributes didn't pan out well. And so everyone said, oh, he's not going to be athletic enough. Okay. Well, according to our analysis, it's very easy to change athleticism. So we don't actually weigh that variable of the ability to jump high or run fast that high. But we weight things like your ability to shoot a basketball and those skills that we find very difficult to actually build to be worth more. And so we decide to pick you up. And so now we begin to have value assessment and appraisal. So every athlete can be looked at. We have from our standpoint of skills trainers, okay, we're not doing a really good job of developing shooters. We're doing a good job of ball handling, but not this. Um, and oh, why or why not? Do we need to seek out other resources? Do we need to seek out new information? Do we need to seek out new people to come work for us and teach us? Um, it becomes a very much a living organism system directed at one goal. And then the idea is you begin to start to create value beyond just the traditional sense of acquisition, trading, and uh, value asset collection, like the Oklahoma City Thunder have like 1 million picks over the next 10 years. Because uh, I believe the GM there is uh, Sam Presti, if I'm not mistaken, has an amazing job of asset collection, um, management and trading, but not necessarily a value creation proposition. A value creation proposition is more commonly seen in like the Oakland A's in baseball, where they get these players and they bring them up to the uh, farm league or minor league and they have to acquire someone that fits within a certain realm. And the coach gets high level extraction of it. That'd be like um, Billy Bean and Moneyball. And so that's a concept that's really important as well. So you begin to start layer these metrics together. And what's interesting here is unlike baseball, which seemed to be, and baseball is a wonderful sport. And I haven't dove into it for a while, but the traditional sense of Moneyball was like the acquisition of players and certain adjustments and certain things, uh, like taking more pitches and valuing certain metrics. But now you actually the creation process of it. So it'd be the example of like, we value someone who has a high swing velocity in baseball. So we're going to train that specific velocity. Um, the idea is now you have a unity between strength coaches and skills coaches. There is no difference. And so what happens is there is certain times athletes don't lift weights. And certain times athletes might just work on skills a whole bunch more. And what's beautiful about that is they're actually the same staff. They're working together. 
And so no one feels the need to have to train someone, the need to have to work someone out um, because it's all under one general uh, guided direction versus this segmented approach of arbitrary collection of metrics, data, and information. Um, I've been in many different conversations with uh, professional teams and they all have different metrics. I had the luxury of going down and speaking in a professional team in a minor league baseball setting, not minor league, major league baseball setting, spring training, uh, to their entire staff. We did something very similar to this. We sat down with 50 of their staff. We had their PTs, their skills guys, and we ended up talking about uh, base stealing. And that was of significance to one of the skills coaches. And they're talking about deciding whether or not what's the best stance and approach to get a best lead off. And then the strength coaches were talking about, oh, well, that's important for the skill acquisition. We can train these certain things in the weight room. And so no longer is like, is there this differentiation between this is what we do in the weight room, this is what we do with that. We have priority of skill development. And then we have training predicated or built around that priority of skill development for ultimately value creation. Um, and so that's what I would begin with, starting with the coach, uh, that idea and the GM, the idea of a framework of a team, you have definition of it. And then you begin to follow uh, the marching orders down because what you don't want is a situation. Imagine you're a strength coach and you get a player and they say, all right, train him. And you're like, well, why'd you pick him? <laughs> why do you have this player? That's really important to understand. What does this player do for you? Why did you acquire um, someone like DeAndre Jordan. DeAndre Jordan is extremely athletic, a uh, big man who's known for blocking lots of shots and getting lots of rebounds. Okay, well, his priority of his physical attributes play a large amount in his skill, like someone like Kenneth Fareed, uh, the Manimal, a great, uh, was an all-time leading rebounder in college, played great for Denver. Um, he does one thing, but maybe someone like a Ryan Anderson, who's a power forward who played at Cal and eventually the Orlando Magic teams, who was a pick and pop four man for uh, Stan Van Gundy, or Jeff Van Gundy, Stan Van Gundy's teams. Um, and he, that's his role. And so what Ryan Anderson is going to do as a three point shooter, as a pick and pop four man, is very different than what Kenneth Freed, who is a rebounding manimal four man. And so what they do in the weight room is very different. You know what Ryan Anderson does in the weight room might be very different. And the priority on his athleticism might be very different as a, as opposed to Kenneth Freed, who's highly dependent on his athleticism. And so he actually doesn't have a huge amount of skill utility in the sense that the coach isn't going to use him to shoot pick and pop jumpers and three pointers. And so his skill training um, will be slowly branched out from his athleticism to say, okay, we're going to build certain qualities that we deem the coach would utilize or the coach said would be useful. And then from there, you begin to extrapolate and build off those branches that are developed. So that's my take. If I was an assistant GM, and maybe this is my informal pitch to be an assistant GM, um, that's what I would do. So I appreciate you all listening. I hope you enjoy as always. Take care. Thank you. And goodbye.